And the people of God said, Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this glorious moment. Thank you, Lord, because of the fire of revival. And we pray that this fire will never die out in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that you open the pages of the scriptures to us. Help us to understand. I will pray that this illumination will lead to inspiration in every life in Jesus' name. And that you grant us the grace to divide the word of truth appropriately and rightly so that we will not mislead the people we are leading in Jesus' name. Keep us awake. Grant us the spirit of understanding and a desire to know you more. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the happy people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're coming to Romans chapter 7. And it's a very special time with us. Because it's a very special chapter. Many preachers struggle with a proper interpretation and application of this chapter. They are not able to rightly divide the word of truth. They don't understand as they look at the chapter. They are confused as to who is Paul the apostle referring to. Because many times he said, I, I, I. And then you are wondering, who is this I? Was it Paul himself? Or was he just writing and representing the Jews and the Gentiles? Is it a personal pronoun, a personal experience, or a personal pronoun of a representative preacher? As we look at this, I pray the Lord will give us understanding. In Romans chapter 7 verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Who was he talking about? He was talking about the Jews. He said, I'm talking to you Jews because you know the law. He says, don't you know, my brethren, brethren in the flesh, because I'm speaking to them that know the law. What does the law say? How the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. You know, he had already developed the theme, the experience that those of us who are now in Christ were dead with Christ and were buried with Christ and were raised with Christ. But now he's saying the people that the law has dominion on they have not died yet. It's writing to those who have not died. And then he goes on in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law seen? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I, that's the word again, pronoun I, I had not known lost, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Look at verse 9. For I, that's the pronoun again, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And then you come to verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Look at verse 16. If then I, that's the pronoun, 
personal. Even I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that the law is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but tell me. Christ dwelling in him. Tell me. The Holy Spirit dwelling in him. No. But sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Christ was not there yet. He's talking about a man that is still struggling. A man that doesn't have Christ within. The Holy Ghost within. And he says, no good thing dwelleth in me. For to will is present with me resolution, determination. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would do, I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. As you look at the pronoun I, I, through the chapter. You know why Paul, the apostle, wrote like that? He tells us, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, and these things, brethren, I have in the figure transferred unto myself. It says, I'm writing, I'm writing to those who know the law. I'm writing to the Jews. I'm writing as a representative of the Jews. And I transfer all this to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. That she might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be popped up for one against another. You see, he was writing because the Jews were proud. And the Jews were saying, We are the people, we're the people of God. We know God, those Gentiles are nobody but now he says he transferred everything to himself before we go on let's look at the personal experience of paul the apostle so that you'll understand that this is not paul in a converted state this is not paul in a regenerate state this is not paul the preacher is transferring it to himself so that the Jews will understand. Look at the experience of Paul himself. We're looking at Acts chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 16. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. For herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense, voice of guilt of condemnation of sin toward God and toward men. That was his personal experience. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 8, reading here from verse 2. For the law of the spirit of, the li of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. As for his personal experience, he said, I am free. I'm not a captive to sin. I am dead to sin. I'm buried with Christ. I've risen with Christ. And he says, he has made me free from the law of sin and death. We come to 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, he tells us about his own personal experience. 
It's not, uh, you know, somebody who is uh, falling and rising and is saying, oh, I'm sorry. The things I didn't want to do, that's what I'm doing. The life I hate, that's what I'm doing. Look at chapter 6, verse 12 of First Corinthians. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. It says, I'm in charge, I'm in control. It says, I know what my life is. And that life is a victorious life. I will not be brought under the power of any evil thing. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep my body under. In chapter 7 of Romans, the man is talking about they could not do that. That one is a slave. That one is a struggling slave, a captive of sin, sold unto sin. But this one, Paul, the apostle, but I keep my body under and bring it into subjection. Lest by any means, when I have prayed to others, I myself should be cast away. Paul was a victor. He had dominion over sin. He had victory over sin. Galatians chapter 2. Reading from verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And so we understand that Paul the Apostle, in writing Romans chapter 7, he wanted to bring the Jews under conviction. He wanted to bring the morally oriented Gentiles under conviction. He wanted to tell them without grace, they couldn't do what they were boasting they were doing. Uh, look at that chapter. Romans chapter 7. If you read it through by yourself later, you're going to find the conspicuous absence of number one, the Holy Spirit is not in this chapter 7. Number two, you're going to find the absence of grace in this chapter. You don't find grace in this chapter. It's not mentioned. Number three, the absence of faith. Look at the whole chapter. From verse 1 to verse 25, there's no grace, there's no faith, there's no Holy Spirit. Number 4, there's no mention of salvation in any form. Saved, saved, salvation. There's no mention of that in chapter 7. And there's no mention of righteousness in chapter 7. That's number 5, no mention of righteousness. In, chapter, in this chapter 7, of Romans, there's no mention of redemption. Redeem, redeemed, redemption, not here in this chapter 7. And in this chapter 7, there's no power. The power that resides in man to do the will of God is not mentioned here in chapter 7. So you understand, it's a chapter without the Holy Spirit. Talking about a man without the Holy Spirit. It's a chapter without grace. Talking about a man without grace. It's a chapter without faith. Talking about a man without faith. It's a chapter without salvation. Talking about a man without salvation. It's a chapter without righteousness. Talking about a man without righteousness. A chapter without redemption. Talking about a man without redemption. A chapter without power. Talking about a man that is powerless in his struggle against sin. As we look at the chapter, 
We're going to divide the chapter to three parts as we look at struggling against indwelling sin without the Spirit. Struggling against indwelling sin without the Spirit. Point number one, the sacredness of an established standard. The sacredness of an established standard. Number two, the sinfulness of the exceedingly sinful. The sinfulness of the exceedingly sinful. Number three, the struggle of an enslaved soul. The struggle of an enslaved soul. We're coming to number one, the sacredness of an established standard. Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as is he liveth. He's talking to the Jews. If you're still living, you have not died with Christ. If you're still living, you have not died to sin, as in chapter 6, then the law has dominion on you. And he wants to illustrate that by an established standard. It says in verse 2, For the woman that has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. He said, until the husband is dead, that woman is under the authority and the influence and the covenant of the husband. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. It was an established standard. It is still the established standard of the word of God in marriage. Until death do us part. So then, verse 3, if her husband liveth, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. Because the scripture does not allow divorce and remarriage. It says, if while the husband is alive, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. And if his wife liveth, and he, the man, be married to another woman, he shall be called an adulterer. For if her husband, but if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. He's saying, the husband is alive. That woman is bound to the husband. The wife is alive. That man is bound to the wife. If one of them dies, then the one that is alive is free to go and marry. He's proving something here. He's saying, if you are alive to the law and you do circumcision and you do ceremonies and you kill this and you kill that lambs, and then you go through your rituals and the Jewish religion. Okay, you are lying to the law. And so then the law has dominion over you. But if you are dead to the law, now you are no more under that law. You are free to be married to another, that is to Christ. And because the law is dead now, the false covenant, the old covenant is abolished. And it is dead because it's dead now you are free to come to Christ and to be joined unto Christ and to be married unto Christ. And let's look at the real situation between husband and wife. First Corinthians chapter 7. In First Corinthians chapter 7, here we're reading from verse 39. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. It tells us in verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she's at liberty, she's free to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. But now he's telling us, 
that we are not we are not alive to the Lord. We are dead. Look at this in Colossians chapter three, verse three. Colossians chapter three, verse three. It says, "For ye are dead, for ye are dead. You are attached to the ceremonial law." You are attached to the Jewish law. You are attached to the old covenant. But now you are dead. And your life is seen with Christ in God. You are no more under the dominion of that old covenant, old testament law. Okay, now that you are free, what do you do? You are now married to another. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Reading from verse 2. Second Corinthians 11 verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. It says now the marriage to the law is cancelled. Married to the old covenant is cancelled. And now you are married to another and you are presented as a chaste virgin unto Christ because now you belong to him. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, white, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So you see, it's saying that you are separated from the law by death. The death of the law and the death of the man, the believer that is dead to the law. And you are now married unto Christ. Come back to Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become, oh, look at that. Ye are also become, tell me the next word. Tell me out loud. Tell me as you appreciate what you are hearing. Now you are dead to the law by the body of Christ, that he should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead that we shall bring forth fruit unto God. This marriage with Christ, this relationship with Christ, this union with Christ brings, brings fruit forth unto God. In verse 5, for when we were, past tense, for when we were, past tense, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did walk in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now, but now, but now, we're delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we shall serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness, in the oldness of the letter. It tells us now it's a new day, it's a new life. We're dead to the law. And because we're dead to the law, we now bring forth fruit unto Christ in chapter 6 of Romans Romans chapter 6 verse 18 being then made free from sin ye became the servants of righteousness verse 22 but now being made free from sin and become servants to God ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life now we come to point number 2 here is uh, the part many people confuse. They don't understand. We're looking at chapter 7 of Romans. And we're reading from verse 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. The sinfulness of the exceedingly sinful. The sinfulness of the exceedingly sinful. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. The Jew is getting concerned about the thing that Paul the Apostle was teaching. 
And the Jew is saying, Paul, what shall we say then? Is this law sin? And then Paul is, is answering. You say, but he was one that wrote everything. Yes, you know, a preacher. He knows his congregation. He knows the Jewish people. He's been a Jew himself. He's a Jew himself. And this is the question he would be asking as a natural Jew if he had not been converted. That's why he's taking the word, he's drawing the word out of the mouth of the Jew. And he's saying, I'm a Jew. Paul, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And Paul answers, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I, he's talking about a Jew, you are a Jew. The Jew would not have known what sin is without the law. For I had not known lost, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me. Remember, it's writing as the representative of the Jews. All manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law was. But when the commandment came, sin revived. And I died, representative of the Jews, at the commandment which was ordained to life. I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me. And by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy. And the commandment holy. Just and good. Was there not that which is good made death unto me? Again, the Jew is saying, I hear you. I follow your reasoning. I understand what you're saying. I'm trying to come to a conclusion now. Because you are telling me that it was the law that actually destroyed you. If it were not the law, you'll be a happy man. You'll be a free man. You'll be moving here and there. But the law came, the commandment came and struck you and pierced you. And now you are dead. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, walking death in me, by that which is good, that sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. That I may know that sin is of the deepest dye. That sin is terrible beyond imagination, beyond description. Here you see he's telling us about a person who has not had the grace of God and there was no godliness and he didn't have any divine help this is all me, this is all me I, I died I, I was convicted I, I was helpless I, I fought, I couldn't win there was no divine help, there was no holiness there was no faith and there was no fruit of the spirit here there was no conversion. Here there was no conquering. Here there was no salvation, no strength, no redemption, no righteousness, no propitiation, and no power. And he's talking about the man that found himself a slave. So that sin might become exceedingly sinful. He's talking about the nature of man after the fall. The nature of man after the fall without conversion. Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we're reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, exceedingly sinful, exceedingly sinful. Now, if that's what God wants, why would he drown the world or the flood? If that was all right, nobody can live right, nobody can overcome. 
Everybody will be struggling. Why did God make that world an example and he perished in the flood? It's not the will of God, but it's the state of the man before he knows Christ. Before he comes to know the Lord is the depravity of man. We're looking at Psalm 58. In Psalm 58, we're reading from verse 3 and verse 4. Psalm 58, verse 3. The wicked are estranged from the worm. That helplessness, man carried it from the mother's womb. That's how he was created. That's what he inherited. It is the helplessness of the human nature. It is the powerlessness of the unconverted man. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Nobody teaches a little child how to tell a lie. Nobody teaches a little child how to get angry. Nobody teaches a little child how to be covetous. Nobody teaches a little child how to bear false witness. Nobody tells a little child how to fight and how to be violent. Nobody tells a little child how to retaliate. It's in the nature. Because of the man who had not been born again, who had not been converted, this was there even from the mother's womb. Look at verse 4. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stops her ear, the natural man. And that natural man is defiled. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3. This is an evil, among all things, that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart. While they live, and after that, they go to the dead. He says, this Solomon, he says, I've been watching the natural man. His heart is full of evil. There is no good thing dwelling in him. It's the natural man. I will come to Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 3. Reading from verse 13, the state of the natural man. Verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 3. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The purpose of uh, Paul the Apostle in this inspired chapter is that he will show the exceeding sinfulness of sin, the utter helplessness, hopelessness of the natural man, the damnable hypocrisy of the defeated or regenerate sinner. That's why the chapter is like this. But understand, as I pointed out, there's no mention of the spirit in the man we find in this chapter. It says, no good sin dwelleth in me. It says, sin dwelleth in me. Now, if the spirit is not dwelling in him, how do you understand that? Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. The second part of verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, second part. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, is none of he is. The man in Romans chapter 7 does not have the spirit as the helper. The spirit as the light, as a guide, as a strength. The spirit as the power that propels him to live in righteousness. A man without the spirit is none of his. I pointed out to you that there's no grace in that chapter. And the person in that chapter is crying out, O wretched man that I am, 
who shall deliver me out of the body of this death? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You remember I told you, you don't find faith in that chapter, chapter 7. You don't find faith in chapter 7 of Romans. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In that chapter, I pointed out to you there is no salvation. You don't find salvation in that chapter. Christ has not come into there. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him. I will abide with him. But no, no good thing dwelleth in him. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 verse 12 It reminds us neither is there salvation in any other For there is none other name under heaven Given among men whereby we must be saved I reminded you there is no righteousness in that chapter 7 Second Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 21, for he has made him to be sin, the sin offering for us, the sacrifice for us, the atonement for us, the propitiation for us. He has made him to be the substitute for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I reminded you, you don't find redemption in that chapter 7. In, in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, reading from verse 7. We need redemption, redemption, redemption. You don't find it in that chapter. Ephesians 1 verse 7, in whom we have redemption. Through his blood, for the forgiveness of sins. You don't find forgiveness there. All you find there is struggling, guilt, condemnation, crying out, wretched man that I am. But now we have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You remember, there's no power in that chapter. No power in that chapter. I struggle, I fall. I struggle, I fail, I struggle, I'm destroyed, oh wretched man that I am. But there's power in Christ. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do, exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. In chapter 7 of Romans, is sin that dwelleth in me and sin that walketh in me. But here, when you come to the right side of Calvary, the power that walketh in us. We're coming to chapter 7 of Romans, and I'm reading from verse 14. Point number 3, the struggle of an enslaved soul. The struggle of an enslaved soul. What did he read from verse 14? Romans chapter 7 verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not the struggling man. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. Some sinners will tell you that because they know the consequence of that sin. Some sinners will tell you that. That's why they make resolution at the end of the year. 
That's why they have a kind of determination. That's why sometimes they go into penance and they punish themselves when they find themselves doing something you know they shouldn't be doing but they have no power they'll do it again they'll do it again it tells us in verse 16 if then i do that which i would not i consent unto the law that it is good the commandments are good the commandments are wonderful now then it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me christ does not dwell inside yet the spirit is not living inside him yet grace is not within him yet the power power to conquer is not living inside him yet for i know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good sin for to will is present with me to decide is present with me to make resolution is present with me but to 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 will is present with me but how to perform that which is good i find not for the good that i would do i do not but the evil which i would not that i do now if i do that i would not it is no more i that do it i've lost control it is no more i that do it my heart cannot bear it it is no more i that do it the strength the little strength my natural state can manifest cannot overcome i let it go that is the sheep is on the stormy sea and i can't manage the direction anymore so i let it go it is no more i that do it but sin that dwelleth in me i find then a law that when i would do good evil is present with me by delight in the law of the lord after the inward man i read those laws i say these are beautiful to love your neighbor as yourself beautiful to honor your father and your mother beautiful not to steal beautiful not to covet beautiful not to commit adultery not even in your heart not to have an attraction to somebody who is not your husband somebody who is not your wife it's an ideal beautiful i give consent to the law of god that the law of god is wonderful that you do to your others what you want them to do unto you beautifully great but I only delight in it because I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my flesh. O oh, wretched man that I am. O oh, wretched man that I am. His final cry. His great cry. It's like He's thrown up his hands. He said, what can I do now? I've done everything I could do in my own strength to be free from this thing. And I could not be free. Oh, wretched man that I am. That's not the cry of a son crying, Abba, Father. That's not the cry of a disciple rejoicing because your names are written in heaven. That's not the cry of a member of the family of God who is the joint heir with Jesus Christ. This is not the overcomer that is crying. The overcomer that is overcoming the flesh, overcoming the world, overcoming the devil, overcoming every temptation. No, this is a cry of a failure. This is a cry of a struggling man who could not make it. This is not the cry of a, of a true follower walking after the steps of his savior this is not the cry of the justified having peace with god this is not the cry of a happy christian glorifying the lord rejoicing and testifying i am saved no this is the cry of a man struggling gentle struggling jew struggling religious man Oh, wretched man 
that I am. Who shall deliver me out of the body of this days? Who shall deliver me? Struggling man, struggling woman, let me show you. Who shall deliver me? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, we're reading from verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. That's the answer. Who shall deliver me? Is Christ, victorious Christ, redeeming Christ, saving Christ. He sat down now on the right hand of majesty on high, having purged our sins. Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9, but we'll see Jesus. He will deliver you. I said he will deliver us. But we'll see Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. It takes us out of that dungeon of defeat and crying with sorrow. And it lifts us up, it forgives us, it sets us free, bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause is not a shame to call them brethren. Chapter 3 of Hebrews, I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Come and be joined to the living God, and then you'll not be that bitter, just sorrowful, and just regretting. I'm a failure. I'm defeated. I struggle. I try, and I could not make it. It says, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Lest anybody should give up and say, all right, I tried, I couldn't make it. You didn't get to Calvary. I struggled, I couldn't have the victory. You didn't have the blood of Jesus washing your water than snow. And I have made resolutions and determinations and I cannot make it. So I give up. No, don't give up. That's the deceitfulness of sin. For we are part made partakers of Christ. We are made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, we come to Calvary again. We come to the cross again. And we hold on to the power that can cleanse, to the power that can sustain us. We look at Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 15 and 16. For we have not, we have not an high priest, which cannot be taught with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Who shall deliver me? Christ is waiting. Is waiting with the fullness of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And he says, he will deliver us. Chapter 5, verse 9. And be made perfect. He became the author of eternal salvation. Unto all that obey him, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. He has become the author and the provider of salvation, eternal salvation to all the people that will respond unto him. Chapter 6, verse 1. 
Therefore, living the principles of the doctrine of Christ, living all that struggling of the unconverted man, living all that period of resolutions and failure, living all that period, all the primary period of not knowing who Christ is, let us let us live the therefore living the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to perfection. Now Christ has come and Christ has shed his blood and we're looking up to him who shall deliver me from this body of death look at Christ is willing and is ready and is able to take you to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God that is repenting every week repenting every Sunday repenting every month and repenting at every program let's come out of that and come to the light of the victory that we have in Christ Verse 12, that she be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Chapter 7 of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore he is able, who shall deliver me out of this body of death? Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy and harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Let's come to him. Chapter 8 of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. We're looking at verse 6. But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, Christ has come. It's greater than Moses. Christ has come. It's greater than Aaron. Christ has come. It's greater than the angels. Christ has come. It's greater than all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And all those Jews and all those Gentiles, they couldn't have victory because they were limited. And they cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Now Christ has obtained, he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Look at verse 10 there. For this is the covenant that I will make for the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind. And then that law in the mind will drive away the sin and the wretchedness that dwells within. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Chapter 9 of Hebrews, we're looking at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Who shall deliver me, verse 11, for Christ being come? and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an earth of an earth sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh how much more how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit of God himself without spot to God purge 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 your conscience from dead works to serve the living God chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 who shall deliver me he has come his name is Jesus he's the redeemer is the deliverer the final sacrifice Hebrews chapter 10 reading from verse 16 this is the covenant chapter 10 this is the covenant verse 16 that I will make of them after those this says the Lord I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more now where the remission of these is there's no more offering for sin have been there for brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near let us draw near who shall deliver 
me from this body of death, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith, with, uh, with our, of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Hold on to that faith, he is able. Hold on to that faith, he will. We're looking in at uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews and verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. You must believe that God is greater than all that struggling. You must believe that the power of the blood of the Lamb is greater than all the struggling and struggling and struggling. You must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Hey, don't say, well, I'm, I'm a believer, but I'm a believer of Romans chapter 7. No, there's no believer in Romans chapter 7. I mean, I'm a child of God, but I'm a child of God of Romans chapter 7. No, there's no child of God in Romans chapter 7. It's a struggling slave. A, summary, a, a struggling captive of sin. It says, don't give any excuse. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 14, for no peace will with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Christ is here to deliver. The power of Christ is here to break that backbone of sin that dwells in anyone. He'll make you victorious in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 20. Now, the God of peace. That brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. Make you perfect. Make you perfect. In every good work to do his will, walk in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever come out of that dungeon come out of the behind the curtain and come out of your hiding place you're hiding there and you're hiding in defeat come out because there is light as you come to Christ and there is power as you come to Christ and there is authority as you come to Christ and there is victory all through your lives as you come to Christ rise up and tell the Lord now I understand now I understand now I understand oh Lord Touch me. O oh Lord, purify me. O oh Lord, cancel the power of sin in my life. Get me out of that chapter 7 and let me come to the bright light on the mountaintop of the glory of the victory coming from Calvary.